So now we're going to our first actual presentation of the day. And uh, who better to start off uh, this process than uh, Jill Carr Harris, Dr. Jill Carr Harris. Um, she is one of the leaders of the Jai Jagat movement. She's an educator and an activist. And she is really helping to bring the relevance of Gandhi to today, especially in areas like um, uh, gender equity, um, education, leadership, and the economy. And uh, we're going to hear a little bit about some of that work from Jill now. And I'm just going to ask people to please turn off their videos because Jill is also in a kind of remote area where uh, her connection is not so good. And we want to make sure that we get the best possible reception for her. So thank you. And Jill, over to you. Thank you, Jai Jagat. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for being part of this teaching today. I want to thank particularly Reva, Dr. Reva Joshi for and the Speaking Our Peace team, Priya, Annie, Ashima, uh, for making this teaching possible. I, I think I remember um, way back when, when teachings during the era of uh, working on disarmament and peace in the 1980s, we used to have teachings. And I'm so delighted it has been brought back because this is a very important time where we're facing so much conflict and violence. Um, so it, it provides a wonderful platform. Thank you, team, uh, speaking our peace team. Um, I wanted to say that the uh, first podcast that you just saw of uh, Julie Christensen and Irakli Kakabadze took place in Georgia. And it was, uh, Georgia being in the South Caucasus is on the other side of the Black Sea from Ukraine. And the Georgians, uh, I've been in touch with them very much recently concerning the deep fear and the deep polarization that is happening in their society because of the Ukraine war. And uh, the, the fact that Georgia, like Ukraine, is not a member of NATO, and they also have Russian occupation on their territory. So I want to begin and say that I think this teaching is at a very timely moment for Georgians and people who are deeply affected uh, on the outskirts and also uh, for the people uh, who are directly related to this war. Um, it is horrific. And on the face of it, there's little justification for so many loss of lives. I think as a mother uh, and as a woman, I'm sickened and pained by the violence that I see. And I feel that so much is being perpetuated on a group of people in a senseless war that is not really their choice. Yet, as a trainer in nonviolence and a peace educator, I realize that these moments teach us about many things. Um, some of those include courage and standing up for the things we believe in. Another uh, important learning uh, that I have been experiencing over the last 50 plus days in watching this war has been the understanding of the deep structural violence that we see, of course, with large arms sales that was mentioned by Rajkopalji, uh, and a, a tremendous vested interest in having war. Uh, and this takes us back to realize that sometimes we need these moments to face structural violence, to reassert and reaffirm the importance of peace, which I know we're going to be doing in the next four to four and a half hours with so many important people who are all here today. Um, 
I want to say that Gandhi, um, and having a having been deeply influenced by Gandhi, one of the things he used to say is, "Violence is a better option than cowardice," and I think he he was trying to express that the fear of violence expressed in passivity or denial can be counterproductive and actually even worse than, than the expression of violence. And um, I, the, the people who do express this fear and become very passive and silent, as we see many people across the European and uh, North American and Indian subcontinent where I am right now, this uh, silence is allowing people to become co-opted. So between silence and violence, we have to find uh, an active nonviolence, not just a passive one. And in finding active nonviolence, we can stand up for what we genuine, genuinely believe to be true um, and not just give in uh, uh, for the sake of protecting what we see as our perceived security. So this is a big lesson. And um, I'm hoping that um, different peace actions which people are doing, uh, some of those voices will resonate to that people are not being co-opted, that they're continuing to stand up with an act of nonviolence to face conflict, whether it's in uh, Ukraine right now or in other conflict areas or in other areas suffering conflict. Um, the, uh, there, there's three things I wanted to communicate in the teaching of nonviolence, which I've been a part of uh, in India uh, for many years, that we look at three things related to nonviolence. We look at it as, as a principle, a strategy, and we live it as an action. And uh, in our discussions with youth today, uh, as or the in our non formal education, uh, which we do mostly, um, rather than formal education, we try to bring forward a notion that it's really important in active nonviolence to stand firmly uh, on something, a sense of truth that you believe in, that you truly believe in and are willing to fight for, but you do that in a nonviolent way. And let's say this is something we, we talk with young people and they say, is this a kind of intention? Yeah, it's a sustained intention. An intention, for instance, like, living a nonviolent life. We may not achieve complete nonviolence or peace in any given moment in life, but it's an intention, a uh, 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 search for uh, being more nonviolent. And that intention, uh, when it is a print, when you really deeply and firmly are prepared to fight for it, um, is how do you express it nonviolently? You do it through communication and through expression. So you can be really angry about injustice, which is fair enough. We need to be um, uh, upset in order to motivate ourselves, but we do not need to provoke and to speak uh, in violent terms uh, for justice. We can speak about it nonviolently. This comes through training where anger is controlled. An anger over injustice 
is somewhat controlled so we can have massive impact in our act of nonviolence. And um, also, uh, people who are actively nonviolent tend to reflect their nonviolence in a chosen lifestyle, a lifestyle that expresses that one wants to struggle, but also one wants to do it in a way that is not harming others while you're struggling against those who are being harmed. So back to Ukraine, we struggle against the injustice of how we see that struggle, uh, but we do it in a way that maximizes our inner force, uh, our inner principle for what we believe. And I think this is why many young people say, oh, that's the Gandhian phrase, be the change you want to see in the world. It's you want to act this feeling of nonviolence against injustice and, uh, and, uh, and, and see it as firmly something you will fight for because you believe in it. That's where it's a principle. But of course, when you fight for something, you need a way of organizing yourself to struggle and to build change. And uh, we know in um, there is violent struggle going on in Ukraine today, but there's also nonviolent struggle for people who are standing in front of tanks. There are civilians that are continuing to live in spite of having the option to leave or who are coming back to be, uh, to be there, to be present, to be part of that change uh, for peace. You know, we, we often think in India, where I am, I'm right now in northern Karnataka, uh, in southern India, and I'm going to describe that in a minute, but this is the land where Gandhi uh, led his freedom struggle. And clearly, he carried out a very difficult struggle against the British, and he did it nonviolently, not you know, very differently than Martin Luther King against racial injustice or Nelson Mandela against the transition away from apartheid. But these sustained campaigns, which they led, did not last for a few minutes. In violence, things move very quickly. You can bring a uh, uh, ways of harming other people very quickly into play. But those who have a deep act of nonviolence, a way of wanting to express that in a campaign or struggle with other people, do that over a longer period of time. It is a sustained intention of a group. Those are the strategies which uh, nonviolence allows us to express active nonviolence against injustice. If we really believe that the uh, human security uh, is a better way, um, as the many Georgians uh, would like to see, less uh, polarization in their societies near Ukraine, where they have to choose between one side or the other. They want to sustain campaigns where they can express the way they move to peace. Uh, I think the great campaign which uh, Irakli Kakabadze, which you just heard, uh, worked on a sustained nonviolent campaign for peace was through peace zones. and. Uh, you didn't hear that in that part of the speaking or piece. I, I recommend that you go and hear the full interview to see how they sustain an active nonviolent campaign against the uh, forces of conflict 
that have been created by the larger powers uh, of Russia and, and NATO and how they're trying to find peace uh, within that scenario. Um, you know, uh, another kind of campaign uh, which uh, shows active nonviolence is something that we're working right now, right here. So I just wanted to introduce you to that. We are talking right now with many people as we are traveling through in what we call a yatra, a trip. You know, when you move, you do education because you're talking to people and working with them uh, on an aspect of nonviolence. And the aspect we are working on right now here is on nonviolent economy. Now, what is this nonviolent economy mean? It means we're trying to find ways to, to do economic activities that brings us a greater cooperation and greater sensitivity to the earth. So we don't have to violate the earth's resources to gain a livelihood. We can live in harmony with nature. We don't have to compete and fight in a competitive economic world. We can find ways to cooperate. So this is what we're right now doing. We're moving through uh, hundreds of my, uh, kilometers of area, looking at how people are moving from violent uh, monoculture, violent industrial agriculture to nonviolent organic agriculture or natural farming. We're looking at how people are building uh, industries that are small scale using appropriate or intermediate technologies and not simply depending on large technological systems. Uh, Nonviolent economy, uh, I mean, there is no uh, more important thing than technology, but it needs to be a that does not direct us, but that helps build a nonviolent economy. So we're having these many discussions uh, with groups of people over 1500 kilometers. So we're moving in a car. This is an educational tool, if you will, in building nonviolence and nonviolent education by talking to people and saying, uh, uh, showcasing some of the nonviolent uh, economic experiences that people are, that people are having. And I just want to give one example of where we are today. We are in a beautiful campus. And this campus is producing textile from cotton. And it is uh, creating employment for 800 poor woman, women in the villages who now have livelihood in terms of weaving and sewing this cotton into garment. But this cotton is a uh, being naturally dyed and we're using natural as opposed to chemical dyes so that dye when it goes down into the water does not create toxicity but creates an adequate water supply for people and that uh, um, uh, natural dyeing creates beautiful cloth that people can wear that does not stain, which does not run, that does not create any uh, problem when it is uh, when it is no longer of use and goes into the earth again. So this is a a place that is looking at a nonviolent economy production process, and it is done in a beautiful campus where 
the, the trees are all around, the houses are made of mud, the people uh, eat all uh, natural foods. So it is creating a climate of good health, of good environment, and of a sustainability. So when you bring together, and this is where I'm slowly going to bring my presentation to a close, when you bring in uh, e a more equal relationships, like our 800 poor women who are now being seen within the marketplace because they're able to get income for this uh, cloth to feed their families and to bring them up. I have been so happy to see that many of their children have all gone to university and are leading lives in advancing the families. Their influence on their children is to show them that they have found a way of doing economic activity that is bringing equality, sustainability, and also peace. And these are the kinds of economies that we need to build. And that is why we're on this educational tour. And if I had better internet, I would have introduced you to the Africans who are here, the people from Europe and Canada who have come all the way to come on this tour with Indian friends to see these wonderful processes like Charka, the name of the group here, Charaka, uh, uh, meaning spinning wheel, this beautiful production of natural dyed cloth. So friends, uh, our Georgians, when they were talking about peace zones and wanting to bring this to you, the Ukrainian-Russian struggle, how to build not only demilitarized zones, but zones of peace building, they were thinking of also introducing people to a nonviolent economy. Uh, when you have nonviolent economy, you tend to have more nonviolent governance. And this creates those cultures uh, and societies of peace that Reva spoke about earlier. And we need a long term plan. And as Rajkopal said, working on the periphery to bring people together in order to build societies that are peaceful and based on peaceful processes, whether it's women producing cotton or farmers producing organic agriculture or others making producer and co uh, consumer come together with greater fairness and justice. So um, I want to conclude by thanking uh, the hosts for giving me some time uh, to speak today and to also say that uh, we invite all friends who want to participate in any of our nonviolent programs. Uh, we welcome uh, your interaction in future and we do this in the spirit of bringing peace, not only to India and to your countries, but also to Ukraine and Russia. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Jai Jagat.